Our very gracious hosts, uh, Mr. Arun Firodia and Mrs. Jayshree Firodia. Uh, my guru for the for, for her life, lifetime, Dr. Mashelkar, the glorious awardee, Dr. Shuto Sharma, Ovin Sarupji. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, young friends, uh, I think after that, after that lecture by Dr. Mashelkar, uh, it should be actually followed by silence so that we could absorb all that he has said today and all the young people here. So I think I actually feel like an intruder at this moment uh, for, for following after you. And then also because... Uh, you know, with all this eminence, scientists and everything here, and being a mere economist, I just don't fit in into that whole realm and sphere, which is of the, the stratosphere that you got created. So um, I, I don't know. I'll keep it very short, therefore. And um, I just wanted to say that um, uh, probably the only reason that um, I deserve to be here is that I'm one of those uh, few economists, maybe, who had had the fortune of meeting Mr. H.K. Ferodia in person and spending about an hour, about hour and a half with him uh, in his office in, uh, in, in his factory because I was in 1984-85, I was uh, undertaking a study on uh, the, the motorcycle and two wheelers industry in India and asking the question whether this industry will survive uh, once India liberalizes and opens up its borders. Because that was a big question at that time in the mid 80s and I dare say I led a project which was funded by IDRC uh, to look at a whole set of six industries, uh, ranging from uh, machine tools to, uh, to machine tools, automobiles, two-wheelers, bicycles, and FMCG products, cosmetics, and so on, the entire spectrum of technology, to ask the question, is, if we liberalized, will these industries you know, live? And our, I, with due immodesty, I can say that some of our uh, uh, results and findings, it's, you know, which were ably transmitted to the government by my mentor to begin with, Dr. K.B. Lal, who was the chairman of, uh, of India's former Commerce Secretary and ICS officer of great repute. It was transmitted ably to the then government concern, and that did play a role in India opening up in 1991. And so therefore, I think that to that extent, I'm, 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 I'm quite sure that Mr. H.K. Ferodia would have commended me uh, for, for doing uh, what I did. And I remember at that time, he was going through the process of launching the Kainet Econida. And he was, he was very proud of the fact that it, 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 it embodied new technology and it embodied, uh, you know, and he had tested it on Indian conditions. And then, the, you know, the rest is history as we go forward. So, ladies and gentlemen, uh, I, it's my honor to, uh, uh, you know, have presented the award here. Uh, it's my honor to have um, sort of shared the memory of the legendary Mr. H.K. Ferodia. And I do hope uh, that Pune, uh, you know, the center where you had this college since, 1985 or 86, one of the first colleges, will continue to lead the country in innovation and technology and science. And that's what the country needs. Uh, so that's, uh, that's, uh, uh, I, this is why uh, I, I'm in here, if you like. And just, uh, just to sort of uh, point out, which I discovered recently, that such awards have a huge meaning and have a huge purpose, including, Mr. including Mahatma Gandhi, who in 1944 instituted the award for finding a new charkha and announced it in the Times of London. And the prize, by the way, that he instituted at that point of time was 1,200 guineas. And that's what the prize that he had, that, that he had announced. And I, dare, I, I must uh, sort of uh, commend to everybody to convert that into inflation accounting and then calculate the value of that award at this point of time for doing something like a charkha. And I think this is where we need to take, because the incentives before our young minds the incentives to become innovators and not followers, I think, are still not enough despite all that we are doing. And that's what uh, Niti Aayog is about. Niti Aayog is trying to put together uh, the tinkering labs, you know, which, which, which give 50 lakh to every uh, you know, school that is selected, followed by 2 lakhs every year uh, for the next five years. We are doing the Atal uh, incubating centers where we are giving 10 crores for each, you know, for each incubation center. But, I mean, my view is that even that's probably not enough because we need to increase these numbers, we need to spread, and as Mr. Sharma said, you know, if you can get a million minds, you know, blazing away in this country uh, at all points of time, India has the potential uh, to become, as Dr. Swami Vivekanand said, uh, the guru of the world, and I think that's the potential we need to seek. Uh, I just want to make um, 
uh, three really uh, point, small points, because these continue to worry me, and I'm not going to uh, elaborate on them. And, and these are, and maybe these are not the most appropriate at this time of celebrating, in this evening of celebrating science and innovation. But you know, I have to ask as an economist the question as to why does the R&D spend in India remain so low? We do spend only 0.8 to 1% of our GDP you know, on, on R&D. And, and you know, the other countries do 3.5, 4, 2.8, whatever, but much bigger economies spending more, you know, much larger share of their GDP on R&D. We need to ask this question. You know, why, why is it that we are doing that? And by the way, of that 0.8%, 80%, if I'm not wrong, comes from the public sector. And the private sector, with whatever all the you know, provinces it has, is not taking up its share. But there must be some structural underlying deep reason for this to happen. And I, and I, would, I, would, I would invite comments, and I invite feedback. I don't want to even, uh, even, even hazard my own hypothesis in this regard. But the question needs to be answered. The second question, that I want to ask, and which comes back to me all the time is that, and, and this is with Dr. Sharma here and Dr. Marshall Karu headed CSIR, and, you know, and, 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 and he's now heading the Department of Science and Technology. Why do we continue to have relatively small islands of excellence like ISRO in our country? Why, these, why don't these islands become much larger? And why don't these islands become, you know, sort of huge continents where innovation and, and, and breakthrough science and technology is taking place. Dr. Sharma said that we are the third largest, uh, perhaps, in, you know, in writing papers. But, you know, as the Prime Minister said himself, the societal relevance of these technologies is still not being well established. And I think we need to work at that. And that's the second question as to how can we... And the third and final question is that, and I hope I'm wrong, and I hope I can be corrected, is that I still find that the necessary condition for a society to become innovative and go forward, and which is the mutual trust between individuals, which is the mutual trust between public sector and the private sector, which is the ability to work together, which Dr. Marshalker created in the National Chemical Labs when he was a director here, and to get teams working together from private firms and, you know, and, and public sector labs, it's not there. And that, Dr. Mashelkar, if I may hazard the guess, was the reason where we missed the pole vaulting opportunities. Because one person, and I know, and I give an example, when I was doing my research in 1980 uh, with Dr. Sanjay Lal, and I came here to look at India as an exporter of technology, uh, we found that HMT in 1978, I think, and Dr. R.H. Patil, whom we met, who was the director of HMT, told us the story that he had signed all the, the, all the you know, documents, et cetera, with NASA to transfer the technology for, you know, for the crystal uh, you know, movement of the watch, you know, and, you know, which is not the, you know, the, the other, you know, the, what is it called? Not the mechanical, but the, you know, the digital movement of the watch. And his, his officers were on way to Houston to get that, to sign that final document and come back. They were stopped in Brussels uh, by the government, concerned government department and told we don't need to do that because one of our labs, and I don't want to mention that, has said that they will, they will produce this technology, the digital technology watch mechanism, in the next six months. And that was the days of DGTD, you should remember. Because if you could, if you could prove that you, have a, if you had an indigenous source of technology, then the imports would immediately stop. They came back from, they came back from Brussels, and 11 years later, the same technology HMT imported from Citizen Watch Company in Japan, who had imported, who bought that technology from NASA and beat the Swiss out of the watch industry completely. We could have been there. And there are several stories like that. But the underlying factor, ladies and gentlemen, behind those stories is that we in India are refusing to work as Team India. We are not working together as one on being on the same page. We don't cherish the goal that Dr. Marshalker pointed out to us, that we have to be global leaders, and that we can be. We somehow, in fact, I think, somehow even question the ability of India to be global leaders. I think it's time, and I think this is where the younger generation will give us the lead, 
And I think we oldies have to move out, because the younger generation I see in their eyes and in their behavior, the confidence of being the global leaders, the confidence that we will not follow, but we will lead, the confidence that there needs to be an Indian model of development and an Indian source of his innovation and technology, and the ability to say, as he says, that we will become the best you know, science and innovation country to going forward. But there, I think we need to work together and follow what the Prime Minister has said, which is that we have to make development and the development science and technology into a mass movement. This is what Mahatma Gandhi achieved in 1942 when he converted the national movement from that being a movement of the elite to being a movement of the masses. So that the last peasant in Noah Khali thing thought that what he was doing was a fight against the colonial masters. If tomorrow we can start, and this is the sankalp to Samriddhi that he's been talking about, if all of us can make the sankalp that each one of us will be ourselves thinking out of ourselves and not just about us and, and, and helping the other to make the breakthrough and make the development and science and technology into a mass movement, I think there's no reason to believe that we will not be able to successfully pole vault into the highest ranks of the world global community. Thank you very much, ladies and gentlemen, for this. <laughs>